A racing driver is an enthusiast, it's a mindset and it's an athlete. Today we're going to look at taking the first steps into becoming a racing driver. <laughs> I'm Will Egby, a former British Car Championship competitor, and I'm now taking my first steps into car racing. As I navigated the confusing world of getting started, I thought I could have really done with a video to help me with this, and this is that video. I'll take you through every step from getting started, getting your license, and to budgeting and planning for the season. Every step is vital, so make sure you watch to the end to get the full picture. <laughs> First up is your ARDS test. You of course need a license to be able to compete and register for any events. Now you order the Go Racing Starter Pack from Motorsport UK and in it are the forms you need to fill out and some helpful guides. On a USB stick comes a video designed to help you pass both the theory and the practical test. It's very important that you revise that, especially the flags, because in that section you need to get 100%. You need to know whether it's a waved or a static or a double waved, yellow, etc. The other sections, to be honest, are common sense. And if you can't pass them without revising, probably shouldn't be on the racetrack anyway. And you don't even need to get 100% in those. But I did, so, you know, above and beyond. No, I just sound arrogant. My top tip for the theory section is think logically about safety and make sure you've revised your flags. My top tips for the practical section are it's not about outright pace. The thing you need to focus on in one word is consistency, where you break, where you turn in, hitting your turning point, apex point. Once you've got a good base racing line down, then the instructor will go quiet in the car, they'll stop helping you, and that's when your test starts for sort of three laps. I believe the guide is 10 to 15% within the outright pace, which actually is quite a way off. So you've got a margin, just be consistent, calm, relax, no moments, no slides, nothing, just really composed. Just think, if you were the instructor and all day long you had to get in cars with people who think they're racing drivers and they're really fast and they had to prove themselves and they could be et and sen around Brands Hatch, you wouldn't want that job. That's a pretty terrifying job. So keep it safe and consistent. So next, what the hell are you going to race? Are you going to race single seaters? Are you going to race touring cars, classic cars like me? So. What are the factors that help determine this? Well, competitiveness is one. What do you feel you want to do? How many races are in the championship? Are they local to you? All the simple, basic things. And of course, the big one, budget, which I'll talk about more later on. And you've also got other options with regards to buying the car. Some series rent you the car, some teams rent you the car, or do you have the abilities to run the car yourself? Before you buy anything at all, make sure you attend one of the events. Get a feel for the vibe. Is it for you? Do you think, oh, this is a bit intimidating. What's it really like to be a part of that paddock? So next up is the big one, it's budgeting. And this is of course very linked to the series that you're in and the competitiveness of it. Certain series have much higher costs, but also to be really competitive in a highly competitive series, you're gonna need more sets of tires, more engine rebuilds, for example. I'm gonna make a full video on budgeting because it's so important and it's such a huge factor in everything you do in racing as you'll learn pretty quickly, but here's a quick list of things to consider that you might not have before. And of course, like I said, there's team fees and buying the car and rental of the car, like I mentioned before with the series, but here's the add-ons. First up, you have tires and wheels. You might need multiple sets of wets, dries, you might need new ones, they might come with a car that you buy. How much are they and how often are you going to be getting them? For example, for my car, it's a classic car, it runs on quite expensive vintage tires, but you don't need them very often at all. You gotta make sure you weigh that up. Don't be put off by the price of the tires outright. Then you have, of course, entry fees and admin fees. Are you gonna go testing? How many tests are you gonna do? How much are the entry fees for the race weekends? You also have the cost of your license from MSUK. Then on the actual weekends, you have the hotels you're staying at. If it's a long way to travel, the fuel to get up there. Are you hiring a trailer? Do you need a tow bar? Which is a problem I'm currently working with, tow bars and trailers. 
then you have mechanics. If you do think you can run the car yourself, can you do it as one person or do you have a mate that can help you out? You then have your rebuild components like engine and gearbox. So I tend to think of engine rebuilds, gearbox rebuilds, tires as consumables because you're gonna wear them out and they're gonna have to be done at some point. It's unavoidable, so those are your consumable items. Things like the car and often your helmet and suit, those are pretty fixed. You're not cycling through those very often. And the last thing you have to buy, of course, is your driver kit. So, you've got balaclava, helmet, hands, intercom system if you're going down that route. You've got your suit, you've got Nomex underwear if you choose to go for it. You've got normal underwear, which you should always go with. You've got boots and you've got gloves. Now this is of course protecting your body so the rule is buy the best you can afford. You can probably get a whole kit for about seven, eight hundred pounds but equally you can do two grand on a hands device and four and a half on a helmet in one go if you wanted to. You can see a theme here, it, it racks up quite quickly. When you're at this stage where you've decided the series you're going to do, you need to check what they require. If it's an FIA homologated event, you will need full Nomex underwear, socks, everything. But if it's an MSA event, you need, of course, a fireproof suit, but you don't need the underwear. There's also different standards and certifications for helmets. For some series, it must be in date and recent. For others, it can be slightly older. So this is very series relevant. Of course, if you're buying towards the top end, likely it will be good for everything. If you're on a tighter budget and you're buying things with less Snell certifications, etc., you've got FIA 8856-2018, or you've got all these standards, so make sure it meets the ones for your series. And the final thing on budget is don't think you're never gonna crash because you will, you will have some damage, whether it's someone goes off in the gravel in front of you and you get stone chips on your windows, you get stone chip on your bonnet and knees touching up, or you just bin it completely into the wall yourself. These are things that need to be accounted for. When you take a trip in the gravel, you often need to break the tires off the beads and get them refitted because gravel gets absolutely everywhere but you need to have a damage and maintenance fund. Do not go into the season believing you've spent all you need to spend because that's a lie. Next up is registering for the event. So you've got your kit, you've got your car, you've got everything. You will then need to join the racing club. Now each championship generally has a club. So Mazda MX-5s is BRSCC. I'm doing classic touring car championship. So I'm a member of their club and the BARC. Then you'll be allowed to register for the championship, choose your number, etc. register your car and get the car's passport, which is like the car's license to compete. You need to look at the regs before you register. So you can check that your car meets everything and see if you want to change a seat, for example, what standard it has to meet, steering wheel, etc. So you need to look at the regs once you've registered. Then you register for your events on an event by event basis. You have your championship registration that allows you to enter for events, then you enter to each event. Now this is of course all online now, so you need your membership numbers. And when you get to the track, you generally don't have to sign in in an office anymore. You do that all online. So you've registered for the championship, you're booked into the event. What's left to do? Well, if you're serious about doing well, you've got to read all the way through the regs. You've got to understand the safety car procedures, yellow flag procedures. They all differ for championships. You want to have a good understanding of the car, what setups you're allowed to change. Is tow out angle free or is it fixed? Are different spring rates and spring lengths allowed? You need to be across all of this. So once you've read through the regs, you understand the championship and the events. Then you have to understand and learn the track. You need to know good overtaking opportunities, the racing lines in wet and dry. Ideally, you want to watch an onboard of a car very similar to yours going around the track with a decent driver, but watch something similar, get a good idea. Then the only factor left during a race is the other people. So watch last year's events, learn how other people race. Is he a really hard racer? He likes to go in late on the brakes. Does he have a tendency to go around the outside? So when you come across him, you squeeze him out wide. You need to have an understanding of the event, the circuit and the other competitors. So there you have it, a complete guide from zero to your first race event. If you found this video useful, please like and comment any questions you have. If there's anything I've missed out, let me know and I will reply in the comments. Please subscribe and next time I see you, it will be after my first test in the IMP. So I'll get that video ready for you. Very, very excited.